How much time does our world have? History is littered with man's failed attempts for utopia on Earth. Kingdoms crumble and empires evaporate. What is the destiny of man? How can one find personal peace? Can we know the future? Yes, we can. Throughout the scriptures, God has sent messages of hope to help us recognize our place in time and prepare for the future. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Millennium of Prophecy with Doug Batchelor. Good evening, friends, and welcome to Manhattan Center on this wonderful Tuesday night. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us again as we continue our excursion through the Bible. And I can tell by the response here, and I hope by the response where you're watching our program, that you have been excited about what you've learned, and you're trying to share that with someone else. So continue coming, because these next two nights are vitally important subjects. Tomorrow night, Cities of Ashes, tonight... The Witch of Endor. Well, friends, join with me as we welcome our speaker for this evening, as well as for the rest of our seminar, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Thank you. Thank you, John. God bless. Welcome, everybody, here at Manhattan. And welcome to the Millennium of Prophecy Seminar to our friends who are watching around the country and around the world. We have been overwhelmed with the exciting reports that we're receiving from Africa, South America, Australia. Well, I'll let Mrs. Batchelor tell you more about that. Are you doing your homework? Are you doing your lessons? We hope that you're excited about the wonderful things that we're learning together from God's Word. And uh, I'd like to invite Mrs. Batchelor out now. We're going to see what kind of Bible questions have come in. We've had over 1,800 different responses that have come in via email not counting some that have come in from facts and other methods, a prayer request, Bible questions and reports, and uh, some very nice comments, too. All right, we're going to go ahead and start with our first question. Okay. Then. In the Bible, it says that there will be no more marriage relationships in heaven. Will other human earthly family relationships also be dissolved? For instance, parent, child, aunts, uncles, cousins. Well, ultimately, we're part of the family of God, those who are worthy to be in that kingdom. Now, some people have wondered, well, Jesus says, and if there's only one scripture, what did we learn about one scripture? Don't Be careful not to build a whole theology based on one scripture. Don't neglect that scripture, but make sure that it's not the foundation for you know, an upside-down pyramid. There is one scripture where Jesus says, speaking of the resurrection, that they will be, it's Matthew, they'll be as the angels which neither marry nor are given in marriage. And it seems to indicate there will be no new marriages and no procreation in the new earth. And some people hear this and they say, but I haven't had a baby yet and I want to have one. You mean we can't have one in heaven? And, well, we have reason to believe the answer is no. Remember what Jesus said to Adam and Eve? Be fruitful and fill the earth. That's the original language. Uh, God is going to populate the new earth with the redeemed. And, you know, at the heart of this question, some people say, well, won't there be any children in heaven? Well, there will be at first. We learned that, right? Uh, but the Bible says, Malachi chapter 4, they shall go forth and grow up. God designed us to grow. And so you might say, in theory, there may come a day where there will be no babies in heaven. Let me address something. People, when they ask about heaven, that was our last study, almost sound like they're worried they're not going to be happy there. Uh, I've had people say, you mean my parrot won't be there? There's no resurrection for pets? Uh, when I told you, you know, we don't have any scriptures that tell us that uh, God has, is going to redeem our pets. But let me guarantee you, just get there. And I'll promise you, nobody's going to be unhappy, okay? Is that fair? <laughs> nobody's going to say, hey, you know, there's no golf. I, I don't think I could be happy here. So just get there, and I promise you, everybody's going to be satisfied beyond their wildest imagination. You know, one thing I've always thought is interesting, I always get four times as many questions of people asking about their pets being in heaven than their spouses. <laughs> I don't know what the significance of that is, but that worries me. I don't think that's good news. No, that's not good. <laughs> okay. 
Is it true that Acts 20, verse 7 proves that the New Testament church was keeping Sunday? Wasn't breaking bread a communion service? Okay, thank you very much. Turn to Acts chapter 20, verse 7. What page? Uh, in the Seminar Bibles, it's page 1629. Now, be patient. We always get a lot of questions on the Sabbath truth when that's presented, and you can understand why. So many people are shocked. A lot of very dear, sincere Christian people say, you know, I've been going to church on Sunday all my life, and then I learned this, and there's so much Bible evidence, but what do I do? And, and I've got this church family and all these things I've learned. What do I do with the Sabbath truth? So, first of all, we're not here to pressure anybody. We're here to open the Word and tell you the relationship of these things with the Sabbath. The Holy Spirit will have to speak to your heart. But please make me a promise. Hear what the Bible says. Do not plug your ears as the religious leaders did just before they stoned Stephen. Listen to what the truth is. Be open. Does that sound fair? Amen. Jesus said, let him that has ears hear what the Spirit says. So just listen to what the Scriptures are. Some people take Acts chapter 20, verse 7, and they say this is where Sunday was established, or this is New Testament proof that Sunday, the first day of the week, is the new Christian Sabbath. Let's read it together, and you see if that's what the Bible is saying. And on the first day of the week, that would be what we commonly think of Sunday at first glance, when the disciples came together to break bread, and people stop right there and they say, they close their Bibles, and they say, see that, Doug? First day, break bread, communion service. They are having a religious meeting on the first day. This is biblical evidence that the Christians now were recognizing the first day as their new Sabbath. Okay, let's look at that for a second. I'm not afraid of that. What day of the week was the first communion service where Jesus broke bread? Thursday. Thursday. Is Thursday our new Sabbath day? No. Did G Jesus do important things in the process of saving us on many different days? Yes. What day of the week did he say, it is finished? Friday. Friday. Is that the new Sabbath day now because that event took place? He died on a Friday. It makes it the new Christian Sabbath. No, you, there's nothing in the Bible that tells us because Jesus did something on a certain day, it becomes the new Sabbath. Furthermore, if you go to Acts chapter 2, verse 46, you'll find out the disciples broke bread daily from house to house. Does that mean we're supposed to keep every day as a holy day and a new Sabbath day? Some people say, Doug, I know that you keep the seventh day as your Sabbath, but I worship God seven days a week. And people fear, they feel very pious and holy when they tell me they worship God seven days a week. And I say, well, I worship God seven days a week too, but I don't rest seven days a week. You're not holy if you do that. You're lazy, right? There's nothing pious about that. And so I do believe we should worship God seven days a week. Let's keep looking. Go back to Acts chapter 20. The disciples came together to break bread. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. And he continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered. All right. Biblically, when does a day begin and end? 12 midnight? They would look at their digital watch and say, oh, day's ending. You know when daylight savings times ends and begins? Two in the morning. That's when they adjust the changes. And the, the Romans are the ones who established the midnight thing. And that came much later. But up until hundreds of years after Christ, days begin and end at sundown. It says, and at even when the sun did set. Okay? Now here's an evening meeting, and it's calling it the first day of the week. What day would that be? We would commonly call that Saturday night. See, when the sun went down on the seventh day, the first of the week began. Those of you who have King James Bibles, you'll notice the word is in italics here. That means the word is not in the original language. The way it reads is, on the first of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, why did they come together? They'd been together all day worshiping God on the Sabbath. This is now Saturday night. Paul's getting ready to uh, commence a journey on Sunday, certainly not keeping it like a Sabbath, which would be the first of the week. There's nothing in the context that's telling us God's now establishing a new holy day. The reason that uh, Luke records this story is Eutychus falls out the window because Paul preached too long. There's a lesson for you preachers. And you too. You preach too long, you can kill people. <laughs> Eutychus fell out the window. He died. Did you know I'm related to the Apostle Paul? My mother's maiden name is Tarshish. Remember I told you I'm Jewish. That's the Hebrew word for Tarsus. Now, 
I, my grandfather tells me that, and friends, I'd love to believe it. But uh, anyway, it's fun to share people that we could be related. That's why I preached so long. That's why I was sharing that with you. Anyway, so Paul is telling this story because he embraced someone who fell three stories and died, and he came back to life. That's the purpose for the story. They're not establishing a new fourth commandment, okay? So do you agree that this is the honest interpretation? That makes sense? Okay. All right. If there will be no crime in heaven, what is the purpose for the high wall around the city of Jerusalem? You know, here in New York City... It came from New York City. It was fun. You know what we did yesterday? Tell us. I went back... Well, I will. Here we go. Ready? <laughs> I went back after 28 years to the house where I grew up on 81st Street, 15 West 81st Street. And I asked the doorman, I said, do you mind if we peek our nose in? He said, why? And I said, well, I used to live here. And he started quizzing me to see if I was telling the truth. And I started naming some of the tenants that he recognized. One of the people that lived in our building was the actor Lloyd Bridges. Some of you remember him, father of Jeff and Bo Bridges. And he was our neighbor upstairs. He said, oh, yeah. And then he said he remembered my mother. He said, I've been here 30 years. I remember your mother. And he said he was retiring next door. So we went out and we got a picture and I got to walk through my old lobby and Karen wanted to know if we'd go upstairs and see the old apartment. But I didn't think the new tenants would like that very much. But uh, it was really exciting. What does that have to do with answering about walls? I don't know. Oh, let's get back to the question here. I'm still so excited that the same doorman was still there. In any event, what made me think of that was as we walked the streets, I saw all the bars on the windows. And in some of the cities and in our civilization, we build walls as barriers to keep danger out. But that's not the only purpose for a wall. Walls also keep things in. Your skin is a wall, keeps you together. A walls mark off territory. They're not always because there's something dangerous on the outside. The New Jerusalem is the city, and God is creating mansions for us in the city. And then we go forth, it says, we will plant vineyards and build houses. And so we'll have a country home we build. Jesus builds the city home. That's why the walls are there. They're not because there's danger on the outside. Well, friends, tonight we have an exciting study. We're going to be talking about the Witch of Endor, the Bible subject on what happens when you die. Now, we went out on the streets in Manhattan again to try and get a little feedback so that uh, we could get a feel for what some of the concepts are that are out there. You know, Manhattan's a great place to get these interviews because it's sort of a microcosm for the world. What happens when you die? Listen up and you'll hear some of the responses that we received. Hopefully, we'll go to heaven, but I assume that the spirits will be around guiding everyone, you know. Well, I think um, when I die, there might be an endeavor um, like there's got now, and I think my soul will live on. I think when we die, we all go to heaven. Nobody goes other places. We all go to heaven. People die, I just feel we dead. There's no more, just as if we was, before we was born, we was just nothing. We go back to nothing. Let's go back to the essence. That's it. It depends, but I mean, if you have evolved to the point where, you know, you, you have no material possessions and you, you have suffered and you've given yourself to the world, like you've spent your life giving, then your soul will go on to a higher plane. If not, if you haven't reached that level of evolution, your soul will have to wait until there's another place here for you on Earth and then will come back reincarnated as another person. Well, when we die, I do believe that we either go to heaven or you go to hell. And I do believe that the good ones go to heaven and you have another life there and the bad ones, I don't know, go to hell. Well, there you have it, friends. And that's a very small sampling of some of the theories that are floating out there regarding what happens when you die. You know, one thing we do know, we're only here for a little while and we pay taxes, right? And if you live long enough, you're going to die, right? But people are so confused about one of the most important questions in life, and that's what happens next. We're going to find out what the Bible teaches on that. Do you believe the Bible? Amen. You're going to learn some maybe new things that you've not heard before. And I just want to ask you to pray that God will give you an open mind. Matter of fact, let's bow our heads together for just a moment. Father in heaven, 
Lord, we pray that both in this auditorium here in New York City and around the world, around North America, that your spirit right now will take control of our minds and our hearts as we open the blessed book together. I pray that we will base our conclusions on thus saith the Lord. And it's in Christ's name we ask. Amen. Well, we're going to start with an amazing fact that I think will tie well into our study for tonight. Perhaps you've heard of the Winchester Mansion that can be found in San Jose, California. A little history behind this. During the height of the Civil War, Sarah Party met and married William W. Winchester, who was the son of the famous rifle manufacturer. You've heard of the Winchester Rifles. They had one child, Anne, who died about nine months later from, uh, after, or nine months after her birth. Then a few years later, William died of tuberculosis. Mrs. Winchester was deeply upset by the premature deaths of her husband and daughter, and she supposedly consulted a spiritualistic medium who explained that the spirits of all those who had been killed by the rifles her family had manufactured had pronounced a curse on her. But the medium also stated that she could escape the curse by moving west, buy a house, and construct an ever-growing mansion to house the good spirits and confound or confuse the bad ones. Evidently, in 1884, must be some truth to it, because she moved to San Jose, California. She purchased an eight-room farmhouse. She then immediately began a never-ending building project. She had almost unlimited funds from the inheritance and resources from the Winchester Rifle Company. She managed to keep 40 to 60 servants constantly busy. She had no master plan, and she had these carpenters working according to whatever and whenever she got an urge and she'd tell them how to build. Every night, supposedly, Sarah would go to her seance room and receive messages from the spirits telling her what she should build next. These bizarre orders resulted in some strange creations, such as doors that open onto walls, stairs that go nowhere, cupboards with only a half inch of storage space, tiny doorways and hallways just big enough for Sarah to go through. She was four feet, ten inches, and very slight build. The rambling structure has 160 rooms, 2,000 doors, 10,000 windows, 150,000 panes of glass. It boasts 40 stairways, 47 fireplaces, 13 bathrooms, and she managed to keep this crew of carpenters busy for nearly 40 years, working 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, building, 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 to appease the spirits of the dead who would be haunting her. And now that uh, strange mansion is called the Winchester Mystery House, and it's kind of a creepy place to walk around. Supposedly, many of the staircases have 13 steps, and there's a lot of spiritualistic uh, connections that they make with that strange mansion, haunted by the spirits of the dead. What does the Bible teach happens when we die? You know, on occasion or two, I've walked with my family through cemeteries. I'm a pastor. I conduct funerals sometimes. And you walk around, you read the tombstones. Anyone here ever do that? Just you read the tombstones. You don't need to interview people on the streets of New York City to find out there's confusion regarding what happens when someone dies. Just read the tombstones. Some people actually have a, a sense of humor right up to the very end. I remember Dr. James Dobson said his father told his mother to put on his tombstone, I told her I was sick. <laughs> I told Karen, put on mine, but the light was green. <laughs> oh, you said that. But some of them are very sad. Sometimes you'll see a tombstone, and you see the mother and baby died the same day. Some of these older ones, the mother died giving birth. Some of the tombstones will say, Our beloved mother, now in heaven, walking golden streets, singing with angels. The other tombstone, same church cemetery, will say, Our mother is sleeping sweetly in the arms of Jesus, awaiting the trumpet, the resurrection trumpet. And you can just go from tombstone to tombstone, and you get the idea that even in a Christian church cemetery, there was no consensus on what happened when you died. Well, we're going to find out what the Bible says. Does that sound like a good idea? Let's go to our lesson and our historical for tonight, dealing with the witch of Endor. And we'll see what we can learn together as we proceed. King Saul was the first king of the United Empire of Israel. And he was chosen by God. Spirit-filled man at first. He was very humble, even though he was very tall. The Bible says he was a head and shoulders 
bigger than everyone else, majestic bearing. But as he went on with his monarchy, you know the expression, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. He became self-centered. He began to spurn the law and commandments of the Lord. Things got so bad that he sent his soldiers into a, a village and he slaughtered a whole town of priests and their families. Saul became haunted by demons because he grieved away the Holy Spirit. He would not listen to God. Instead, he listened to his own proud inclinations and he basically became spirit-possessed. King David used to come from time to time and play a harp for him to try and soothe his torment. Finally, towards the end of his life, the Philistine army gathered. They were approaching. He knew that there was no way that his smaller forces could win the victory. He had lost faith in God's ability. He tried to get the priests to talk to him or the prophets or get some guidance from God. But, you know, the Bible says, if you turn away your ear from hearing the law, then your prayer becomes an abomination. That's why it's important for us to listen to God now while he's speaking to us. Finally, in desperation to get some kind of guidance, he thought, if, if I could go to a spiritist, a medium, a witch, and he had his soldiers hunt down somebody who would give him some guidance from the other side. Finally, they found a witch. He said, uh, we want you to conjure up the spirit of Samuel the prophet that he might tell me what to do about fighting with the Philistines. And she went through her hocus pocus and threw some gunpowder in the fire and pretty soon she shrieked and said, I see an image, an apparition. And Saul had to ask her, what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending up out of the earth. Well, is that where the gods are? And then this apparition that claimed to be Samuel, might have looked like Samuel and sounded like Samuel, gave an utterly discouraging message to Saul and mingled some truth in with the message. Does the devil have the way of mingling truth with his deceptions? And he said, tomorrow you're going to die and your sons are going to die and we're all going to be together. Made it sound like we're all going to the same place. Wicked Saul with godly Samuel. Well, you know, that's what happened. The next day in battle, the battle waxed sore against Saul and he was wounded by the archers. His sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchishua were killed. Jonathan, the good friend of King David, was killed in that battle. Finally, Saul, when he realized he could not escape, utterly discouraged, he took a sword and he fell upon it. He committed suicide like Judas. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, since he had lost his charge, an armor bearer used to lay down his life to save the person he was protecting, he fell likewise upon his sword and he died with him. You can see it's not a good idea to get your information from the witches and to talk to the spirit world. It could cost you your life. You could be misled. Let's go to our first question and find out what the Bible teaches about this issue of what happens when you die. Question number one, was the form that Saul saw actually Samuel the prophet or was it something else? Answer, 1 Kings 22, 22. And he said, I'll go forth and I will be a lying spirit. You here in Manhattan, if you've got your lessons filled out, you say the answers with me at home, call them out. Helps you remember better. A lying spirit. Are there spirits out there that lie? Yes. Evidently, yes. Revelation 16, 14 tells us, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles. These fallen angels called demons and devils can create illusions. Remember, Satan was an angel of light. He understood the power of a light, manipulating light, and creating three-dimensional holograms and illusions. The devil can do that. He can project himself in ways that will deceive. Question number two. Do the dead come back to converse with or to haunt the living? Now, this is a very important subject. We need to understand what the Bible says. Will you believe the Bible? Yes. I hope that you'll go with what the Scriptures say. All right, listen to what Job said. A godly man, the Bible says he was perfect. Speaking of the dead, Job says in 1421, his sons come to honor and he knoweth it not. Furthermore, it tells us, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5 and 6, the dead know not anything. Now, that's so important, I want to say it again. This is Solomon speaking, wisest man who ever lived. He said, the dead know not. How much? They don't know anything. How much did the dead know? 
That's what the Bible says, and it should be very clear to you. Now stay with me, and I'm going to answer every one of your questions that you might have from the Bible. Furthermore, it goes on to say, the memory of them is forgotten. Also, their love, say them with me, and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Now, when it says they don't have a portion forever, some people think, does that mean that they never live again? No. It says under the sun. That means they never come back in this life or under this sun. So it's telling us when the dead die, they don't come back and haunt anybody. You can read Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 9 and 6, or verse uh, 5 and 6 and 10. For there is no work nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where you're going. Here's some additional scriptures that are not in your lesson. You might write them down. There's hundreds of scriptures in the Bible on this subject. We don't have room for them all. Psalm 115, King David said, The dead praise not the Lord. Now, if you die, you go right to heaven. And like one of our uh, interviewers said, everybody goes to heaven. You'd think the first thing you'd do if you... Got there, especially if you didn't deserve it, you'd be praising the Lord, right? It's telling us here the dead don't praise the Lord. Psalm 6, 5, in death there is no remembrance of thee. Then you can also go on to Job 7, 10. And there's another one. He shall return no more to his house. Do they come back and haunt their houses? No. no. Bible says that they do not return Furthermore, death cannot celebrate thee. Isaiah 38, 18. It says in Psalms 146, verse 4, his thoughts perish. Now, this is a small sampling of what you find in the Bible, and we're going to give you some more from the New Testament. Number three, according to the book of Revelation, who has the keys of death? Revelation 1, 18, Jesus said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore and have the keys of hell and death. Who is it that has the keys to unlock the grave? Jesus does. Jesus is the resurrection. He's the life. He's the one that will bring people back. When does he do it? As soon as they die or at the resurrection? There's been so much confusion. Everybody knows the judgment is the last day. And there's uh, lots of scriptures on that. And the resurrection is the last day. And yet some people think as soon as you die, you go right to heaven. And people say, now why are we going right to heaven? Then why does Jesus come back to resurrect the dead in Christ if they're already resurrected? And a lot of confusion on this. Let's keep going here. Number four, how did God make man in the beginning? Perhaps if we take a look to start with at what the original plan was, we will better understand the process of what happens when you die. The Bible tells us in Genesis 2, verse 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You notice it does not say man was given a soul. It says man became a soul. The combination of the breath of life with the elements of earth makes a soul. Jesus, now the Bible says all things that were made were made by him, right? Without him was not anything made. So who created Adam and Eve? He is our creator and our redeemer. And after he formed Adam from the dust of the earth, there all the organs were in place and everything was perfect except there was no life. He breathed this power of life, the breath of life into him, and then he became a living soul. doesn't say he gave him a soul, okay? Let's read on here. Question number five. Uh, what happens then at death? It's the reverse process. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7 tells us, Then the dust shall return to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Now somebody's thinking, there you have it, Doug. When a person dies, then the spirit returns to God who gave it. And the spirit is this conscious little ghost, butterfly, comes out of you and flutters off to be with God and waits until Jesus comes back for the resurrection. You don't find that taught in the Bible anywhere that there's this conscious ghost. As a matter of fact, if you read in the Bible, it tells us that not only the righteous 
Ecclesiastes 12 also tells us the wicked, indeed the animals, it says the breath of life of all creatures goes back to God who gave it. You see, the breath of life is that word that's used in Job where he says, all the while my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. You breathe with your nose, right? It's telling us you don't have a ghost up your nose. Some people think the spirit that it's speaking of here that returns to God is this ghost that jumps out of the body and flies off to heaven. Now, some are saying, no, wait, Doug, Bible teaches to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I believe that. That's perfectly true. You know what confuses people? When a person dies, do they have any consciousness of time passing? No. Have any of you had a hard day's work and you... Get your six hours of sleep, but the alarm rings, and it seems like just moments after you close your eyes. And you ever have a day like that? No cotton, and that's when you're still alive, right? How much less awareness of time do you think you have when you're dead? Now, for somebody who died in a saved condition a thousand years ago, their next conscious thought is when the Lord descends from heaven. For them to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Their next conscious thought. They're caught out of the graves, they're raptured up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall they ever be with the Lord. That's why Paul said that. But for those of us who live in this dimension of time, it hasn't happened yet. This is what confuses people. God is not restricted to time. How do you think the Lord takes prophets forward thousands of years in vision? Or he can even take them backwards as he does in Revelation. He is not confined to time. God sees all eternity as the present because he knows all things. We want to know when something happens. Our lives are so limited. We want to know, where are they now? And you've been at funerals, you know, and you'll see the caskets there, and sometimes you can see the departed loved one in the, in the casket, and the pastor's up there, and he's saying, our brother is now with Peter, James, and John, walking on the golden streets, singing with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you're going, looks like he's right there to me, right? <laughs> now, as far as they're concerned, if you've got a loved one that died saved, you can rejoice for them, because their next conscious thought is the resurrection, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, right? But they're not there yet. Because the resurrection hasn't taken place yet. The Lord has not descended yet. See what I'm saying? The judgment hasn't taken place yet. So it wouldn't be very fair to pull people out of heaven and say, I hope you've been enjoying yourself, but now we have to judge you. Or to take people out of hell and say, yeah, we know you've been burning, but now we have to judge you. The resurrection and the judgment are at the end of the world. We'll get to that later. Question number six. Where do the dead go when they die? Answer, Job 21, 32. Yet shall he be brought to the grave and shall remain in the tomb. John 5, 28 and 29. All that are in the graves shall hear his voice and come forth. Where are the dead now? It says he remains in the tomb, and when Jesus comes, they're in the graves. If that's clear, let me hear you say amen. amen. Okay, I just want to make sure that I'm making the subject clear. I remember when I answered very much like some of the people on the screen. As a matter of fact, I probably picked on all of those answers at one time in my searching. I believe that we came back as different things, and then for a while I thought everybody was going, and, and I was just kind of grasping what happens when you die. I was so relieved to find out what really is taught by the Bible, it makes so much sense. Look at this. Life after death, science's search for meaning in near-death experiences. Now, this is where a lot of people get confused. What happens when you die? They say, well, I read a book. I read in a magazine that I bought at the supermarket checkout stand. <laughs> Got to watch out for those magazines, right? I read about someone who died on the operating table. And they were hovering above the operating table and they could see their body and they died. Their heart stopped and they died and they were going to go to heaven and they asked the Lord for one more chance and they came back into their body. Have you heard these stories? <laughs> I heard about a lady gave birth, she was, um, no, this lady was, uh, what do they call it when they knock you out? <laughs> Sedated, unconscious when they, there you go. She was unconscious, she, uh, what, what do they call it? They gassed her, they passed her, they inoculated her, she was out. <laughs> and she came to, and she says, God's told me what to name my baby. I had a dream, and God spoke to me, and he's given me the name for my baby. And the attending nurse who was reviving her said, well, what's that? 
placenta. <laughs> placenta. And she said, you're kidding. No, it's a beautiful placenta. And this lady didn't know what that was. And she was about to name her baby after birth. Is what it amounts to. She thought that God was speaking to her and she was just unconscious. Some of these people who die on the operating table, their hearts stop beating. Their blood is robbed of oxygen. I'm sorry, their brain is robbed of blood and oxygen. They're hallucinating and they're having all kinds of wild dreams. Are we going to build our theology about this big question on a hallucination somebody had in a near-death experience? Other people say, you know, I came out of the grave and I was, I was going towards the light. And there was a blue door and there was a pink door. And if I went through the blue door, I was going to be a boy in my next life. And if I went through the pink door, I was going to be a girl. Other people have these near-death experiences and they say, I was on my way to heaven and the angel said, our computers are down. We've made a mistake. You need to go back. <laughs> no, really, some of them are that ridiculous. And people say, well, I read this book about near-death experiences, so I know what happens now. Please, friends, don't base your theology on somebody's dream. They used to think you died when your heart stopped beating. Now we know that it's really when your brain dies, and it can take a while for that to happen. They had a boy that was drowned in cold water for 45 minutes. You heard about this. It was on national news, I think, in the last year. They revived him because the water was cold. There wasn't even any brain damage. I personally think it's a miracle that that happened. But, you know, when the brain is dead and the cells die, that's where the thoughts are retained. And I've had a lot of doctors explain these near-death experiences are nothing more than wild hallucinations because the brain is being affected by drugs maybe on the operating table or by the actual robbery of oxygen and blood. So be careful about saying, I know what happens because somebody died and this is what they said happens. You'll have all kinds of strange conclusions if that's your basis for information. Number seven, the Bible makes it plain that King David is saved. Now we all know about David who killed Goliath, good King David. How many of you believe he's going to be saved? The Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. Jesus is called the son of David. If you've got any assurance that someone's going to make it, David's going to make it. What does the Bible tell us about where he is now? Acts chapter 2, verse 29. Peter is preaching. This is the New Testament dispensation, New Testament theology. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David that he is both, what does it say? Dead and buried, and his sepulcher, his tomb, is with us unto this day. Acts 2, 34 tells us that David is not ascended into heaven. Now, friends, I don't know if we could be more specific than that. David is dead, he's buried, he's not in heaven. Is that clear to you, what happens to the good? Now, when did David die? Nathan the prophet says, David slept with his fathers. He said he went to sleep about 1,000 years before Christ, 3,000 years by our time today. How long does it seem to David? The Bible says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, David fell asleep, closed his eyes, lost consciousness, and then bingo, he's going to come out of the grave with a glorified body. 3,000 years have gone by for us, but it's not that way for him. He's still dead and buried. That means you know the ones who rose, the Bible says in Matthew 27, some people ascended to heaven with Jesus after his resurrection. You get to the book of Acts and Peter says it wasn't David. David's still dead and buried. Some people rose, but it wasn't all of them because David is still dead and buried by the time you get to the book of Acts. And we'll talk about that more even in this lesson. Is there anyone in heaven now? What's the Bible teach? Yes. Yeah. How many of you remember when Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, Mark chapter 9, what two Old Testament characters appeared to him? Moses and Elijah. Okay? Moses died. You read the book of Jude. It says Michael came and resurrected him. And Jewish tradition tells us, it's not in the Bible, but Jewish tradition tells us three days after his death, the Lord resurrected him. There's no grave for Moses. We've got every reason to believe that he's alive. He appeared to Jesus. Secondarily, how did Elijah get to heaven? He went in a fiery chariot. Who else was translated in the Old Testament without dying? Enoch. The Bible says he walked with God and God took him Amen. after he had Methuselah, his son. You know, I like to ask this trick question sometimes. Who's the oldest man that ever lived? People say Methuselah. Methuselah is the oldest man who ever died. <laughs> Enoch's the oldest man who ever lived because he's never died yet, right? Now, that's not all. There's more in heaven. There are some people in heaven now as we sit on the earth. 
You remember when Jesus died, we just read there in Matthew 27, tells us in Revelation the 24 elders around the throne of God, right? Matthew 27, 52, 53, and the graves were open, and many bodies, does it say all the bodies? Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and then it goes on and says, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So there are some people in heaven now, but the general resurrection has not taken place yet. Now I think we're ready for question number eight. But isn't it true that the soul is immortal and that only the body dies? How many of you have heard about the immortal soul? We all have an immortal soul. You maybe heard songs and sermons and books and poems about the immortal soul. All right, I'm willing to turn a camera around. That's risky in New York City. And ask anybody to show me a scripture in the Bible that says we have an immortal soul. There is no scripture in the Bible that says, no, Doug, we, it, the church has thought this for thousands of years. It must be true. Let's find out what the Bible does say about our immortality, okay? Does that sound fair? All right. Ezekiel 18:4. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, if a soul dies, it's not immortal. Immortal means you can't die. If Ezekiel says the soul that sins will die, that settles it. It's not immortal. You go on. Job 4, 17. Shall mortal man be more just than God? No, obviously not. What kind of man? We're mortal. We don't have immortality yet. 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16. To the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality. Who is it in this life that only has immortality? God, the Lord, is the only one. So let me give you something to think about. What's the first question that's ever asked biblically? First question is the devil questioning God's word. Hath God said, don't believe the Bible, don't believe what God says, question the word of God. Hath God said, We've got a lot of religious people that even question the Word of God. There's even preachers who are into a higher criticism and say, the Bible is a collection of parables and we're not to take it literally. Well, I believe you're supposed to take the Word of God just the way it is. I believe every Word of God is inspired. The world is in trouble now because the devil said, don't believe the Word of God. Then the first lie in the Bible is when the devil said to Eve, you will not surely die. God said, if you eat the fruit, you're going to die. And friends, you know what? Eve is dead today. Am I right? She died. Incidentally, some people say, no, wait, Doug. God said, in the day that you eat it, you'll die. She didn't die that day. Yes, she did. She died spiritually that day. Furthermore, you remember reading where the Bible says, 2 Peter chapter 3, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. What's the longest that any man lived? Methuselah, how long did he live? 969 years. Nobody lived a thousand years. They all died in the day. Spiritually, the day they ate the fruit, physically, within the first millennium. Okay? They were living by virtue of probation that Jesus purchased them. So the devil said, you'll not really die. Isn't it sad now that pastors are telling congregations what the devil first told Eve? Said, you don't really die. You're immortal. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that, does it? Number nine. When will the righteous be given immortality? Now, will we get immortality? Yes, but when is the question. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53. We shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And this, this what? This mortal will put on what? This mortal will put on immortality. When does the mortal become immortal? When the dead are raised, when the Lord descends. Isn't that what the Bible's teaching us? Very, very clear, friends. There's another uh, scripture here. I want you to look at this. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then it says, we who are alive and remain are caught up to meet the dead in Christ who are already with the Lord in the air. They've joined him first 
Isn't it exciting when you consider there are some people here, some who are watching at home, that never need to die? Think about that. Some people today may never die, will be alive and remain when the Lord comes. Number 10, how does the Bible repeatedly refer to death? John 11, 11, Jesus said, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. La and then he went on to explain, Lazarus is dead. So how did Jesus call death? Or sleep. Matthew 27, verse 52. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. You can read also in 2 Samuel 7, 12. Thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. Psalm 13, verse 3. Consider, hear me, O Lord my God, enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. So here you can see that they do sleep, they do die. Did I give you 1 Thessalonians 4, 14? It says, Them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. There are approximately a dozen resurrections in the Bible. In the Old Testament, you've got Elijah resurrected a boy who was dead. Then his apprentice, Elisha, resurrected a boy who was dead. Then a man was put down on the bones of Elisha during his funeral, came back to life. Then Jesus performed several resurrections. Jesus himself rose from the dead. Peter resurrected someone. Paul resurrected a couple of people. And so here you've got several resurrections throughout the Bible. The big question everybody wants to know is, what happens when you die? How long was Lazarus dead? Four days. And Jesus rose him from the grave. Now, did Lazarus, after being dead four days, let's suppose you go right to heaven, as some, so many people think, when you die. Lazarus died. He's up in heaven. He's checking out his new mansion, singing with the angels, walking on golden streets, checking out his new wings. And all of a sudden, after four days, poof, he's back in a grave, wrapped up like a mummy in grave clothes. And he says, thank you, Lord. Would you be grateful for that? Or did you hear Lazarus make a comment and say, Lord, I was down burning in fires of hell. Thank you so much for rescuing me. Don't you think that if you went right to reward at death before the judgment or the resurrection, there'd be some comment from one of the 12 people who were raised from the dead in the Bible? You know what they all say about it? Zero. Silence. Nothing. No commentary on the biggest question. If anybody in the world today had been dead for four days and came back to life, every news anchor in the world, they'd fly with helicopters, they'd get there any way they could, lights would be blazing, they'll say, they put the microphones in their face, say, what happened? Right? Am I right? Yes. The Bible on this subject, they said nothing. You know why? What did we learn? The living know they'll die, but the dead know not anything until they're resurrected. Then they know something. They don't come back and haunt. Why is this subject so important for us? Number 11, since wizards, witches, and psychics cannot contact the dead, who are they contacting? Answer, they are the spirits of devils working miracles. And I want to jump right to question 12, and then I'm going to talk about some difficult issues here. Why does Satan want us to believe that the spirits of the dead are really alive? How does this play into prophecy? Matthew 24, 24, and 25. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and they will show great signs and wonders, so effective, it says, inasmuch that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Behold, I've told you in advance, the devil and his demons are going to perform signs and wonders to deceive the world just like they deceived Saul. Remember, Saul was a leader among God's people. And not only did he die, but many of God's people died in that battle because they were not following the word of God. Now, in the last days, Jesus has warned us in prophecy there's going to be major deceptions in the world. I think it's interesting that it says in Revelation chapter 16 that three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. And they make their way unto the kings, the leaders of the earth, to deceive them, to gather them together to the battle of Armageddon. The leaders of the world's kingdoms are being deceived by these spirits. 
I think it was really interesting. A few years ago, Nancy Reagan actually had an astrological calendar. It's not a rumor. It's true. She admits it. She would use in governing R Ronald Reagan's appointments. She was a lot more into it than he was, especially after the assassination attempt. She began to consult his zodiac sign and schedule things according to that. That should unnerve you to think world leaders are making decisions based on what the lucky stars are saying. And Hillary Clinton kind of played it off when she was trying to consult with a friend who is a medium with Eleanor Roosevelt. You remember that? Played it down when people began to question that. But you'd be surprised how many of these people in high places are spiritualistic. And the devil is going to use demons impersonating departed world leaders, impersonating departed loved ones to guide them. Now, some are thinking right now, Doug, I don't care what you say. My my husband, my wife, died. We were married 50 years, and he or she guides me. I feel they're with me. Have you heard these reports before? I don't mean to be disrespectful. My mother died. My brother died. I was there when it happened. All my life, he was older than me. I never remembered a time when my brother was not there. My mind was filled with memories of my brother. Just yesterday, went back to the place where we used to play. All these memories came back, and you know what? It felt like he was nearby. Was my brother's spirit there, or was he here? He was here. And so you may have these feelings, these uh, sensations that, that somebody's there, but it's not your husband, it's not your wife, it's not your brother. Your mind has been filled with these memories. Now, you've got to be careful, because I heard a story about a lady in San Francisco. And again, this is a story but I got it on a reliable source. Son during the Vietnam War, lost, was not a Christian by any standard. She got a notice from the government, ma'am, we regret to inform you that your son is missing in action and presumed dead. Well, she was overcome with grief because she was a Christian and she understood her son had died lost. After a few days of weeping nonstop, there in her bedroom, her son appeared at the foot of her bed, glowing, said, Mother, don't cry for me. I'm okay. And she, after recovered from some of the shock, she said, what do you mean you're okay? I mean, you, you made no profession of believing in God. Were you converted before your death? And he said, Mom, everybody's going to make it. God is love. The things you read in the Bible about, about uh, God putting people in hell and some people being lost, they're just there to mo motivate people to be good. Everybody's going to make it. And he began to tell her all these things that contradicted the scriptures. For several weeks, he appeared from time to time at the foot of her bed, and, and her whole theology was being transformed by these apparitions that kept appearing of her son. Pretty soon, she was, her heart was yearning for her son. He looked just like her son, sounded just like her son. Then the doorbell rang, and someone knocked on the door in her apartment in San Francisco. She opened up the door, and there was her son, now in uniform. She said, why are you meeting me now at the door? He said, what are you talking about? She reached out and touched him. It was real. It was a real son. Arm was in a sling. He had been wounded. It was a, a misinformation that was given by the government, and I guess by the devil's government as well. He yes. had a computer crash or something. <laughs> and something was appearing to that lady. Was it her son? So you've got to be careful because I tell you, you know, if it's someone close to you, people would rather believe what they see and what they hear, especially if, if it's going to give them satisfaction to see that loved one again. It's really hard to go with what the Word of God says instead of your emotions and your feelings. If you got, go by the Bible, you'll not be deceived. The Bible says that they're asleep, they're dead, they're, it's a dreamless, peaceful sleep, they're unconscious, they do not return to their house. Number 13. Need to move along here. How effective will Satan's use of all these spirits be in the last days? I grab this one. How to contact your loved ones in heaven. Now, they're making it look like Billy Graham is giving information on how to contact your loved ones. He's not. He's not into that. They, they twist things. This is from this month's People magazine. People magazine was quoting a poll from USA Today that says almost 70 million Americans say they think it's possible to communicate with the dead. Are you aware that churches 50 years ago did not believe this the way they do today? Churches are being influenced by the movie industry that is so into the ghosts and talking to the dead. Have you noticed how much there is on that in the media? 
the world is being bombarded and mesmerized and bamboozled with this false teaching. Now you've got 70 million Americans thinking, yeah, the dead people can talk to us. The devil is setting the stage to deceive the whole world with these deceptive spirits. That's why you've got to know what the Bible really teaches or you will be among the deceived. Where are the dead now? They're sleeping. Good and evil both, they're sleeping. And I'll explain more tomorrow why that is good news. All right, now let's go to our answer for question number 13. How effective will Satan's strategies be? Revelation 18, 23. By thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And the movie industry and TVs are setting the stage. They're, they're preparing people to accept the Antichrist and these major deceptions. Revelation 18, 2. Babylon the great is fallen is fallen and has become the habitation of devils. What's another characteristic of Babylon? And the hold of every foul spirit. Foul spirits, fallen angels, demons impersonating departed people. Revelation 12, 9, that old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. Whole world's being deceived by the devil regarding this issue of what happens when you die. He told Eve, you don't really die. That's what it says. You shall not surely die. You don't really die. And he is still echoing that same lie. The sad thing is that Christians are embracing it. We need to go back to the faith that was once delivered to the saints, the Word of God. Amen. Number 14. How does God regard these miracles by evil angels? Should we get involved? Leviticus 20, verse 27. A man also, or a woman, that is a wizard, shall surely be put to death. Now, I'm not telling you to go out there and murder these psychics. I'm just saying in the Old Testament theocracy, that's how they treated people that did that. Furthermore, 1 Timothy 4.1, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Paul is prophesying in the last days people would give heed to seducing spirits. Can you see why we've got to understand this in the light of prophecy? Or we can be deceived. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. You know, I don't think it's even safe to step into these places where they advertise they're going to read your palm and tell your future because you're venturing on enchanted ground. You're trying to engage the devil and it's not safe to do that. Eve thought she could debate with the devil and look how that got us. So don't even go near, don't even dial those numbers to find out what's going to happen. I told you the first thing they do is ask for your credit card. <laughs> One thing you ought to know right away, Old Testament prophets, New Testament prophets never gave a bill for their prophecies. They were free. As soon as someone starts charging you for your prophecy, you can't trust it. You even pay for your fortune cookies, don't you? Well, ultimately, yeah, that's right. So you can't trust that stuff. Where am I now? Galatians 5, verse 19 and 21. The works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry. What else? Witchcraft. Witchcraft. And it goes on to say hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, reviling, and such the like. Then he goes on to say... Sorceries, they, sorcerers, they shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, friends, the Bible is telling us that Christians should not in any way, shape, or form be involved in the occult, spirit mediums. When I grew up here in this city, my mother was in show business. Any of you remember um, a series they had on TV years ago called Dark Shadows? That family that acted in that were good friends of ours. I told you, my mother was in um, show business, and they'd come to our house, and we'd go to theirs. We used to have... The people who actually acted in those were very much into the spirit world. We had our Ouija boards and our seances, and we'd try to talk to Abraham Lincoln and Kennedy and all these different people. And, and you know what? Things happened. Supernatural things happened. Eerie things used to happen. It was real, but it wasn't from Abe Lincoln and John Kennedy. It was from devils. And a lot of people still think that they can play with the devil like that, and it's very, very dangerous. I'm thankful the Lord saved me from that. Amen. Number 15, what glorious power does God offer his people? Philippians 3, verse 10, 
that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. Friends, the Bible is very clear that Jesus is the one who can give us life. Now, let me tell you, I'm going to talk about something that's a very sensitive issue. What happens to a person when they die, biblically? They sleep until when? Till the resurrection. Are you aware that around the world, people are having apparitions of departed Bible figures? The most famous one is Mary. Have you heard about these things? Now, I want to state for the record that I believe that Mary was a saint. I think she is a saint. I believe she was a holy woman. I believe she was especially chosen by God. But Mary is not God. And these appearances of Mary that are happening around the world, many of them happen simultaneously, leave you to the conclusion that Mary is another form of God because she must be omnipresent if Mary is appearing in Spain and Mexico on the same day at the same time. And I don't want to be disrespectful, friends, but you know, there are more and more of these things taking place. And especially, I want to tell my Roman Catholic friends, who I love very much, I went to Catholic schools growing up, I don't want to offend you, but I'm pleading with you, base your theology on the Bible. Amen. Mary is going to be in the heaven, but the Bible does not tell us that Mary or Peter or James or John or your grandma, these people are not appearing to you. They do not go right to heaven or hell. For one thing, suppose a person does go to heaven right after they die, and they're looking down at what's happening here on earth. Suppose your grandma, suppose Grandma Bachelor, she was a Baptist. She died. She goes to heaven. She looks down here on earth. Not one of her four sons, my father and his three brothers, embraced Christianity. How happy is she going to be up there in heaven when she sees all the suffering here on earth? Can you see why God doesn't allow it to happen that way? You've all seen the cartoons and the comics that Peter's at the gate and he's checking people into heaven one by one. Is the Bible teaching that we're going into heaven one by one? Or does the Bible tell us that it's a grand parade? It's a celebration, this grand triumphant procession where we are all caught up. We meet him in the clouds with the resurrected saints. We go back to glory together. Amen. He says, thus shall we ever be with the Lord. Together we're going to go. And it's Christ who's making that all possible. You know, the most important thing is, the Bible tells us, he that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son has not life. Friends, I'm hoping that you will make a decision to have eternal life now. I've got good news for you. Christians do not die. Some of you are thinking, wait a second, Doug, I know a Christian. Biblically, Christians go to sleep. The Bible says, Stephen, saw the heavens open. He saw Jesus, and it says he went to sleep. Christ even gave up the, the breath of life. He said it was finished, and he died so that we don't need to die. The penalty for sin is death, and the promise is that whosoever believes in him would not die. We might go to sleep, but then we wake up with glorified bodies. Amen. You know, I did a funeral for a dear saint. I knew this lady for years, and I knew that she knew Jesus. I'm not the judge, but I knew that this lady was going to make it. And you know what? As I stood there and I saw her, her old body, she lived into her 90s, stretched out there in the casket, I was jealous. I thought, boy, to be Grandma Phillips, her next conscious thought to pop out of the grave with a glorified body, no wrinkles, no aches, no pains, to have immortality and eternal vigor. She had eternal life before she died. The Bible says you can know now that you've got eternal life. If you accept Jesus, he's the one who has the keys of life and death. So many people are afraid of death. I am not afraid of death. I don't worry about dying. I want to be faithful to Christ, and as long as I'm faithful to him, I don't worry about death. It's like that great preacher Whitfield said. A number of people threatened his life, and he said, I am immortal until my work is done. As long as I'm serving God and doing what God wants me to do and I'm where God wants me to be, I'm immortal until my work is done. And what he meant by that is God would protect him. You don't need to be afraid of death, friends, because Jesus makes it possible for each one of us to live eternally, recognizing that God is in full control of earthly events. Are you willing to let him have full control of your life? When you allow the Lord into your life, friends, you don't need to be afraid of death. You don't need to be afraid of anything. 
There are 365 places in the Bible where God says, fear not. Amen. Amen? So many people are afraid of death. They're afraid of dying. You can have eternal life, and it begins now when you accept Jesus. I pray that it's your decision to accept Jesus now. You who are watching, you just need to ask him into your heart right now where you are. Would you pray with me? Loving Lord, thank you for the promise that if we have the Son, we have life. Please come into our hearts, forgive our sins, and then give us power to turn away from sin and be cleansed from sin. Bless the people who are watching and go with us now as we continue studying your word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you, friends. We'll see you again in our next Bible study. The next lesson is dealing with cities of ash. We'll see you then.